Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm here. I, I just want to advise you about something. If you see me looking at my palm, as in what's her name, it's, it's because it says kids can't wait on it because uh, Robert Fogarty, who's from here, is doing a project called Love Notes from New Orleans. And so he photographs people's stuff on their palm. So if you see it, I don't want to be a palinoid figure in your mind. It's okay. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes. I'm going to give you a two and a half hour uh, lecture on uh, the most horrible disaster scenarios you can imagine, but I'm going to do it in 12 minutes, so it's going to go fast. Don't worry. Just, uh, so the first thing is that uh, I'm going to talk about three things, basically. One is so-called wake-up calls, one of my favorite expressions in the human language. And the second thing is we're going to talk about a wish list of lessons I wish we could have learned from previous disasters and didn't. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about recovery from disasters, what that means and everything. So um, the fact is, this is a montage, uh, obviously, of, uh, of some of the events that have happened simply since the year 2000. So it's been a decade of horror stories for lots of people all over the world, including the United States. You may not even remember Y2K, it was so long ago, and I don't blame you if you, if you don't, but it was when we were fearing a technological, technological breakdown, which actually didn't materialize, but it gave us a lot of food for thought about the stability or fragility of our uh, technology. And the World Trade Center, the anthrax attacks, and the great uh, Northeast blackout in 2003, the tsunami, the uh, Hurricane Katrina, the flooding of New Orleans, the FEMA trailers, Haiti, the H1N1, the oil uh, catastrophe, and Pakistan, one after another. This is probably a third of the total number of significant disasters that have happened over this uh, decade. So one would think that there would be a lot of lessons learned from the last disaster we could apply to the next disaster and get better at dealing with it. So if I just uh, pick out a few of these, horrible list, isn't it? So 9-11, a lot, a lot of things that we didn't know about in terms of organizing intelligence and counterintelligence and how do you prevent such a thing and what's really going on. And then you remember a couple hundred firefighters lost their lives because the, the cops could not, literally could not speak to the firefighters and tell them that don't go up there, the building's going to collapse. And just things that you would think we'd work on immediately. Well, we did get better with coordinating intelligence services, but the radio issue is still a work in progress. In many cities, firefighters and EMS workers and, uh, and the police cannot effectively speak to one another during a big emergency. They're working on the technology. Uh, the anthrax um, attacks that came in letters, if you remember, in, in uh, 2001, the end of 2001, uh, we should have far better, more sophisticated detection systems so we could figure out uh, in post offices and other places when there's a biological agent like that that's around there, work in progress. Infrastructure resiliency. That blackout was because the, the grid failed. The grid is horrendous, the electrical grid in the United States. Uh, engineers think there's 2.7 trillion, with a TR, dollars worth of infrastructure fixes that need to be done in the United States. States. It's all a mess, and uh, actually would have been a great job creation machine to say we're going to fix infrastructure, which of course we, we haven't. Early warning systems for tsunami. It's a little seismic device that's on the water, and then you have a loudspeaker in the village on a pole or a tree. About 95% of, in, uh, of uh, tsunami uh, vulnerable regions do not have even these basic warning systems yet in place. In some places they do, but most places they don't. Katrina taught us a lot about many, many, many things, but one of the things, just as an example, is that we saw that the plans for dealing with a major hurricane and flooding of New Orleans were simply inadequate. So you'd think that after that, every place in the country would look at their disaster plans and say, oh, we should fix ours. Uh, certainly not happening. Uh, H1N1, uh, although it turned out not to be, this is the swine flu, uh, turned out not to be a major problem. It did give us a chance to take a, a really close look at America's healthcare system and our capacity to respond to a major pandemic. And we found out that it's in horrible shape. There's not a single city in America, not a single city in America that could handle the medical needs in a major pandemic. Very, very bad uh, situation. There are so many lessons from Haiti, I, I can't begin to tell you, but I will tell you this. About six hours after the earthquake, I was on CNN, and they said to me, so what needs to happen? I said, I'm going to tell you a medical fact. Here's the fact. You have 72 hours to extricate people from the rubble. If you don't get them out of the rubble in 72 hours, the, the mortality rates, the fatality rates will skyrocket. And we could not organize our, even U.S. assets or the international assets, 
uh, for days and days and maybe a couple of weeks and maybe as a few more people were needed. And we had, it's going to be close to 300,000 deaths and it could have been some fraction of that if we had our act together. Haiti, of course, had many, many reasons why it was very difficult to do anything there, but the fact of the matter is you either rescue people or you don't, and we didn't. Uh, so all of these issues, which might be called wake-up calls, these events wake-up calls, <clears throat> because we do get very aroused. We see a lot of media coverage, the journalists are all over these things, and it's nonstop on, on television and in the newspapers until we get tired of it, and the media gets tired of it, and then it's, then it's over. Um, and these wake-up calls, and sometimes there'll be money spent even, but we don't actually fix problems. So I've taken to calling these things actually snooze alarms. Because we do get aroused, and we kind of look around, and we go, oh my God, it's horrible, and then we kind of drift back off into complacency. And that's a really bad thing. So if only it worked like this, that we went from a disaster to gaining insight to then uh, providing innovations to make us better prepared the next time. Next time. This is my wish list, the four big lessons that I wish we would learn, which we would have learned a long time ago. One is preconditions matter. So the people most affected by Katrina are the people that before the storm had significant poverty, disadvantage, and poor access to things. And we have to, I'm mentioning it because we really need to address that if we want to reduce uh, vulnerability to disasters. The second thing is that having empowered, accountable, appropriate, responsible leadership is critical. And in most disasters, and sometimes the bigger the disaster, the worse this is, we just simply can't organize the leadership for what's needed. And in disaster planning, there's a funny thing, they plan for the general population, this is professional disaster planners, and then after they do that, the, the point is that they would move on to special populations, children, the elderly, people in hospitals, incarcerated individuals, and the fact is, if you do it that way, you never get to those other people. Children are 25% of the population. If they're left out of the general thinking about disaster planning, you, you end up setting up a, a minefield that once a disaster happens, you find yourself with parents who won't evacuate because their kids are in a school someplace you didn't plan for it. You find yourself with a horror story because you never really figured out how to evacuate a nursing home or a hospital or whatever the case might be. And fourthly, crisis-driven, innovative thinking about process should come out of every single disaster, but it doesn't. In other words, what do we know about technology? What do we develop uh, in terms of new ways of looking at logistics? And are we doing this effectively? So when we talk, for example, example about one of the most uh, difficult, complex logistics problems is evacuating a city. And we had a lot of problems uh, in 2005, as some of you may remember. And in some places have gotten better, and some places haven't done anything, including some very large cities. A medical health care facility evacuation, uh, a, a disaster waiting to happen everywhere again. Uh, all kinds of technology might be appropriate to think about. So using mobile medical care, which is something my organizations do. We have 50 of these units around the country doing health care for very medically underserved children. It's the Children's Health Fund and my national center. Uh, but we can deploy them in a disaster area when they're needed and then leave when they're gone. Using telemedicine and using electronic medical records to track people are part of these technologies. So is this issue of having interoperable radios or using uh, up-to-date uh, geospatial biosurveillance, all very important aspects of the kind of technology that we should be developing that we're very slowly developing and very slowly implementing in various parts of the country. Now, I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about recovery, because down here, you're into recovery. You're re you recovered from, or you're recovering from uh, this, this massive experience, catastrophic experience that we all saw back in uh, 05. And by the way, we put six mobile units down here then, and we've been here since then in Guluf, uh, Biloxi, Gulfport, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge. We've done 100,000 healthcare and mental health encounters with children since uh, 05. But the question I wanted to uh, point out to you that is not answered is, what exactly is recovery, and particularly, when is recovery over? When are you finished with recovering? And it's actually, as you can imagine, a pretty complicated reality, because recovery really means return to a state of normalcy. And for people who were in bad shape before the disaster, it's a new normalcy. You're rebuilding better. You're restoring. But the problem is that in this quadrant of goals here, the built environment, the buildings, the infrastructure comes first in the mind of people responsible for recovering. And then they're also looking at the economy and are people able to earn a living in this new environment? Are people living in safe and stable housing? 
And the thing that's become so problematic here and everywhere else where there's been a big disaster is that we always marginalize this quadrant, and we do so at our own peril. This issue of, of the human needs. Are children going to school? Are they doing well in school? Are they having stress-related problems that we need to deal with now before they become permanent mental health liabilities? And the fact of the matter is we're not. We just finished a study of, uh, of families who were displaced for a year or more right after Katrina in these places like the FEMA trailer parks, like Renaissance Village. In a report called Legacy of Katrina, and it was a five-year status that we, uh, of children, uh, we, we produced this data. So we followed a cohort, a group of people, uh, over 1,000 families that we spoke to periodically over this period of time. 60% of the children who were displaced for at least a year after Katrina right now are experiencing significant emotional disturbances and or persistent, very stressful housing instability. 50% of children who need mental health services are not getting services. Parents cannot get them medical services because of a variety of uh, problems. More than one-third of the middle school and high school kids that were part of this cohort study uh, are a, a year or more too old for their grade. So um, the question about when is recovery over? And my point about this last issue, this, this thing on recovery, is that it's not over until that fourth quadrant is taken care of. Because we have at least 20,000 children just between Mississippi and Louisiana alone, not counting who might be in Alabama, who's displaced elsewhere. Many people are doing fine who went to other states. Many are not. Uh, so the question is, when is recovery over? And the answer is, when kids say it is. Not necessarily verbalizing it, but when our data shows that every child that was involved in a major disaster is in fact living in stable housing, getting the services that he or she needs, and actually able to meet their potential. Thank you.